if our not uh, the video was not working all right all right now let me go get back to what i was talking okay so the problem i was talking about the problem i was talking about basically was about our stories are you guys with me all right all right extremely sorry for the inconvenience because this is the, probably the first time i have faced this issue so <clears throat> so my question which i was raising was if you have to build 100 terabyte storage how will you build a simple 100 terabyte storage so any answers any answer will do from your side so i want i want to basically see your point of view whatever kind of answers you have you just i mean even if you think your idea is bad or whatever so if you have to build 100 terabyte of storage how will you build it that is my question spread on different machine in a cluster and also need to replicate the data good good but how will you spread that is my question that is my question so how do you spread the data and in what way okay partitioning the data on keys or columns or rows good point good point that is asmita's point now okay okay any more answers good bucketing using hashing technique okay 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 round robin mechanisms that is raghavendra and earlier answers were from manikandan and asmita round robin mechanisms okay okay so round robin is just one strategy a smaller strategy of the whole game so could you be a little more detailed partitioning according to the type of data that is anulita's point so uh, whether it, so we store movies in some machine and and videos um, music in some other machine is that kind of answer you are i mean that uh, is that kind of suggestion you are doing okay okay any any other it'll be great actually i'm i'm seeing a good good point of views here need some intelligent mechanism with track and control the spreading of data on cluster very good point virendra virender and okay the type okay so anuta anuta is saying that the type as i was uh, asking her the types would be of the file to be stored okay okay got got your point should be differentiated okay all right partition the data and distribute the data equally on each partition interesting okay okay that was raghavendra prabhu perfect perfect so any other just your point of view if you have to just build a 100 terabyte storage and there are 500 or maybe thousands of people 
who want to access this data or maybe say 10,000 people who want to access this data and uh, so how would you build it all right all right so this this requirement is not a new one probably every organization faces it but they try to solve it differently and one of the approaches i had taken long 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 back was is this one and this is a common one which had been there for quite some time right so you build a network attached storage or storage area network in some similar format like this so you have bought a hundred bought hundred hard disks each of a capacity of one terabyte and then on each of these hard uh, the, these hard disk we either connected to a computer multiple single computer multiple hard disk and then connected that computer to the network and mounted all of these hard disks using say net some network file system onto a central storage or mounted all of these hard disks on all of these nodes all of these computers now people can access either the central node or any of these nodes to access these hard disks drive one drive two drive three drive four and so on okay so this is this was the common mechanism before before few newer file systems came into play including hdfs do you do you see any problems with this kind of system So Jiva is saying that please move on without asking questions. No, actually the if I keep on uh, talking in one direction, then probably I'll not be able to make my point clear, and that is why I'm asking you the questions, right? My my intention is to uh, you know to make you make you can I mean make you yourself devise a uh, such kind of techniques because these are most of these two tools are common sense it is just that we have not thought enough about these okay good 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 so anilita's point is that what about data replication now the way we had been doing the data replication so far is using say uh, raid raid is redundant array of uh, devices meaning that below the drive one we'll keep one more drive to just keep a mirror of what we store in drive one so that that's a kind of array we will build in case we require a in case we require a data backup all right so will that solve a issue will that solve your problem anulita Virender's point is yes. So the first problem is uh, data replication. Good. Second problem, what Virender has raised is, what if the main folder crashes? Good point. Good point. But as we said that we'll mount all of these hard disk on all of these computers, and we'll tell if one one computer fails, then access from another one. Okay. So I'll, I'll try my best to repeat the questions clearly. Okay. Okay. So first pr problem which people foresee in this one is data replication. Second one is what if one of these nodes like main folder crashes then what happens? The do, both points are very valid. If you have any other uh, problems with this structure of if this is structure then please yep. So do you foresee any other problem with this 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 uh, file system which we have just built? Okay, good point. Jaydeep
increase in cost okay cost is one issue good computation will slow down good point jiva okay searching the data good that is mahesh and jiva is saying that because the data has has to be moved from from all the hard disk to the main system okay no we are not moving the data from all the hard disk to the main system we are just mounting it mounting meaning making a link to that those folders available in the network chansek is saying that single point of contract and failure very good point very good point next one is right right okay so almost all of us have answered uh, what i was expecting so first one is what about failovers and backups or data replication right i said fine we are creating a raid backup but that only protects you against a hard disk failure in case drive one failures we have a raid copy of it what if the computer in which this hard disk was connected that computer has some software issues some some network issues that then the whole purpose is defeated all right the second point is that how would you distribute the data uniformly as somebody said that how would you which computer will contain what data that is another problem and is this the best value for money we already might be having a lot of hard disk lying around or we might be having the smaller hard disk for a cheaper price then is this the best way to do it right and what about increasing accessibility this is some interesting point which we all forget to uh, you know we forget to address say there was a new movie on the on the friday which got really i mean we we got a latest uh, movie and we have put it in a fold in one of the these hard drives now all of the people all maybe hundreds of people want to watch it immediately okay and that will crash that particular hard disk and nobody will be able to watch it so how do you address these problems with this storage therefore because none of the existing solutions were able to address these problems hdfs was built from ground up when there was a need of yes when we had a need of you know a such a system which have to be behave really really fast and which has to store humongous data without any further problems all right so therefore the hdfs was actually created so when we talk about hadoop there are two portions two main component we talk about one is storage hdfs cluster other is mapreduce so first we'll talk about hdfs then we'll move on to the other part so so we we faced this challenge right so we had to store huge data and and we built something in house uh, by connecting multiple computers multiple hard disks but there were various kinds of challenges as i mentioned here right so hdfs solves the challenges so how does it do it how does it solve those problems right so little bit about the architecture so hdfs is basically a network file system a network file system where we store a huge files and how does it do is it has two kinds of node one is single node which is name node it's like a manager of the whole gang and then data nodes which are smaller smaller nodes all right so admin node does nothing other than keeping track of what is where while the data nodes actually store the data all right so each data node contains the 
data while the admin node only tracks of what is where now how does it store the data we so the way it stores the data is slicing that file into a small small pieces and distributing across the network so if you have 100 computers and you have got one gigabit gigabyte file it will slice it into small small chunks and then store it on all the data nodes all right so that small chunk means 128 mb size earlier it was 64 mb now it is 128 mb size all right so <clears throat> so if you have to store say one uh, say hmm, one gb file right so it will slice it into eight eight small pieces and then store it on eight nodes or maybe on two nodes and based on how much replication you demand by default replication demand is three so each piece of this one gigabyte will be stored each piece which is equivalent to 128 mb will be replicated multiple times uh, by default three times onto the multiple data nodes so each data node is containing only small chunk of file and each chunk is also replicated across to another data node so any any data node goes down we already have the chunk right so each data node in itself fairly redundant right and this information that what are the files being stored which chunk is stored where is being done by admin node or name node all right so it's a very clever design in the sense that they instead of storing full full file everywhere what they have done is they have sliced the file into small small pieces and distributed across network just similar to what BitTorrent or any torrent systems do they they slice it into small pieces and and keep it distributed across the network similarly here also every file a binary file say a 1 gb movie a movie will be stored on eight different nodes all right and each piece each block of 128 mb is basically stored on multiple computers there is a replication of three all right so e each data node is fairly redundant and the moment a data node goes down whatever got lost whatever replication factor got reduced it will be backed up quickly by communicating between the data nodes all right so we have got admin node which keeps the does the bookkeeping for you bookkeeping as in which file is on which data nodes file one is on data node one two one, three from this byte to this byte on this one this byte to this byte for, to this one and, and so on so it does a beautiful bookkeeping the name node all right and data node will actually store the actual data right now the question comes in that every time we have to store the file do we always always hand over to name node and then it distributes the answer is no it doesn't so all it does is the driver you use for storing a file say whatever command you're using a hadoop file system command that that command what when it goes to a name node and says hey i want to store this particular movie or this particular 1 gb file it returns back and says go to data node 1 store your data from 0th bit to the uh, the 120, 128 mb bit and then from this bit to this bit onto this data node from and, and that instruction is given by admin node to the to you as in you when i say you you means the command line you are using to manipulate or store the file right so so admin node says back to you that hey go to data node one and data node two and start storing the this data don't bother me i cannot do it do it for you if i start doing it for you then i will become the bottleneck right that's what the 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 behavior of name node is name node it basically instead of name node becoming the bottleneck because name node has got finite bandwidth finite network bandwidth and finite 
rate at which it can write to the disk read from the disk therefore if that uh, bandwidth is utilized from all all other nodes it will be better right so name nodes duty is only to make sure that no two people are writing or editing the same file by providing logs by providing a register he is like a manager the name node is mostly like a manager of the cluster okay so whenever you have to talk, write a file you, you you whenever you have to store a file update a file or delete a file you go to name node and ask hey i want to store this file it will redirect you it will give you the list of data nodes which are free for you and it will mark make a note that uh, name node has instructed you that to go on to this the, the, these nodes and store the your file and the client the client which is your representative will slice the file into a chunk of 128 mb and store on each individual node so that is more or less the architecture of of a sdfs cluster all right now the next question that would arise is what if name node fails as we talked about in case data node fails we have data elsewhere we'll start replicating from there we'll just increase one copy of that one in network and therefore therefore data node is fairly redundant now <clears throat> what happens when admin node fails so there is a there is a concept of secondary name node as well as there is a backup node, name node right both of them they are, both of them are not basically both of them are in a in a standby mode and the moment admin node goes down those nodes are brought to the life all right the other important feature of name node you should remember is that almost all the metadata is stored in the memory which means you will require a bigger memory for name node all right so yeah so let me take few questions and then we'll take a break all right good so virender has asked the question if what if uh, name node goes down probably i have answered already how is it decided on which data node will the replicated chunk go all right so the way it happens that's a very good question asmita so when you use a hadoop file system command to store a file the node which is closest will get the first copy of it all right and the node which is fairly far away will get the second copy when the replication is happening because as i said by default there is a three replication although it's up to you you can even keep for single copy but that's a very very bad way of storing data all right so it is decided based on various factors first is where is the hard disk size available which nodes are free and where and the second criteria is whenever we are storing a file the first copy of the data will be closest to the node which is trying to write the data and second copy will be farthest and third copy will also be uh, will be on the same rack second copy will be on the same rack and third copy will be farthest right so this is and this design keeps on changing between various versions maybe in this uh, latest version they might have changed something else and this is strategy is something which keeps on improving in every version of hdfs all right if the metadata is in memory if the metadata is in memory how would the new name node recovers very good point chandrasekhar so first is that name node keeps on keeping keeps on uh, you know storing every time into the disk whenever it's pushing into the ram just as a backup for the fail safe mechanisms okay it's a file supported ram okay 
it's called uh, there's a particular terminology which i'm not able to recollect but it's called it's uh, file supported ram uh, and <clears throat> And all the transaction log are into file system while metadata is into RAM. Okay, but this RAM is not like you uh, at the moment the uh, RAM is um, system shut down. There is no information. There is information. It's just that when you read the data, it's available in the RAM. And when you write, as soon as a copy goes to the RAM, a copy goes to the disk. So how is high availability of name node and job tracker handled? So to be uh, to be uh, honest, the uh, name node is not really really highly available in the sense that the failover is not really really fast. All right, but people have built name nodes nowadays. Uh, I mean uh, similar systems which are highly available. So the the idea of the name node is it tries to delegate its work to the data nodes so that so that it can be fairly avoided to access the name node. So name node is the least busy system out of all the nodes. Does the so Virendra's question is does the name node know where the data is replicated as per the value of the replication factor exactly? So so name node makes sure the moment the moment it realizes that the the one particular node data node has gone down because the none of the heartbeats have reached from data node to the name node the moment admin node or name node assumes that that particular node has gone down and therefore the 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 file file blocks which are lost on that particular data node we are need to be replicated on a fresh node or or another node so that a replication factor of 3 is maintained across the, in the network okay each block need to be three times in in the network that is the meaning of guaranteeing the replication factor and this transmission transmission of the replication factor does not happen in the manner that if data node if a particular block has got lost now the uh, the same block is available on say data node 2 and we want to replicate it onto data node 5 so name node will not read it name node will simply redirect uh, give the directions to the data node 2 to start copying in itself is start copying to data node 4 okay instead of name node doing it it will just uh, uh, tell data node 2 to start copying the data across okay and that is how that is how the whole replication factor is maintained was i able to answer virendra Is the backup file on HDFS again or or on the local machine? So backup file as I told you the ba backup file means backup file means that each block is backed up multiple times. Okay, so it's an another data node. Zombie's point is a question is that do Hadoop adopt in memory do Hadoop adapt in memory concept as SAP HANA or what is in memory concept so it is actually the opposite of what SAP HANA is SAP HANA is basically a humongous in memory storage okay 200 GB size kind of thing all right so SAP HANA comes with its hardware as well and uh, but here here it, that's not the case our name nodes mostly run fairly well on 8 GB size okay and the objective of HDFS is to provide you a persistent file model okay. 
was he able to answer somewhere okay okay so chandrasekhar when he said what happens to the backup file writer he may mean to ask the metadata backup file writer yeah so whenever you have a name node who is carrying the uh, ca carrying the uh, lot of data in memory so every time you change the memory it gets written to the disk and it behaves like a backup file writer and the actually the backup name node or uh, and the other one the secondary name node they basically read the one which has been persisted to the disk so mahesh's question is can my produce run on top of normal file system instead of hadoop the answer is no okay the answer is no because whenever we say hadoop cluster we mean to say that we are going to use hdfs and on top of that map reduce though every map reduce job can read from any file system that is fairly possible mahesh was I able to answer your question so any other questions with respect to what we have just now discussed so in very essence in a very very simple words in a in a distributed file system called at hadoop distributed file system we have a name node and we have lots of data nodes data nodes store the small chunks of a big file every file you want to store it a name node lets you i mean uh, you break it into small pieces and store on through the data node and before starting any process you always consult name node and name node instructs you where to store what this is the overly simplified view of hdfs if we are clear about this then understanding most of other technologies will be very very simple it's a simple master slave model so <clears throat> sombir's point is are we going to discuss map reduce version 2 with yan so <clears throat> so map reduce uh, i mean does not get impacted by yan or any other design that's a simple concept but i will keep my idea of uh, of basically the job tracker and uh, task tracker in the old fashion in the second session in the second session we'll go into the details about what did yarn bring to the table all right any other question regarding hdfs cluster here we just discussed about a simple design where, uh, where uh, how do we store a huge huge data onto a network of computers and each data node is basically another computer running a process called a hadoop data node all right and similarly similarly you can think of name node also as another computer running a process called name node okay all of these are running on different different ports on on different machines and uh, name node uh, name node knows that what all my data nodes are their ip addresses their their port numbers and that's how it happens so any other questions so uh, now let's take a break of uh, 15 minutes i need to take a break of 15 minutes today so we'll get back at 10:30 and then we will continue for one more hour and in the second half or in that one hour we'll discuss about map reduce and then we'll discuss about uh, the other components of hadoop hadoop infrastructure and we'll give a brief one liner answer to what what does where in the whole ecosystem all right so let's come back at 10:30 ist All right
Hi guys, I'm back. Are you able to hear me clearly? I'm a little late today. Good, good. So, so we had quickly gone through the basics of basics of the HDFS system so far. All right. Now, so this is another pictorial diagram showing how does an HDFS behave. Are you guys with me? Are you guys back? Great. Awesome, awesome. So we have got a great set of team here who is a uh, great audience who is basically really active. Now, <clears throat> so we were talking about HDFS uh, in the, in the f first half of the session. And we talked about name node, data node kind of architecture. This is the same diagram, what I had discussed, where name node is basically maintaining the metadata. And the metadata is, metadata is kind of list of files, list of blocks of each file, and list of data nodes for each blocks, file attributes, access times, etc. All right, these are the various kinds of metadata over there. All right. Now, moving on. So on top of the Hadoop file system, we have got Yarn. Yarn is basically a compute engine, which helps you doing the computation, computation in the network. All right, using hundreds of nodes in parallel, how does it, uh, how to do the computation? That is the duty of YARN. All right, so we'll talk about MapReduce and YARN now. Before we move on to the, the YARN and the detail of the architecture, we'll first, we'll first establish that why do we need a newer framework for the computation in first place, all right? So let's talk about a very, very simple problem. <clears throat> so you have got, say you have got one terabyte of data. All right. Now, <clears throat> and you have got two GB RAM and one gigahertz processor. This is the average computer which we generally have. All right. It's just that we have got one terabyte of data as a network drive and we want to do a computation. We want to do a computation of one terabyte. So how much time do you think it will take to so order the one terabyte data? When we say sort, sort means ordering the data. And this one terabyte is basically 10 billion strings each string is 100 character long right so far basically the sorting is the the basic problem in computing and there are various uses of sorting most of the problems can be broken down into sorting so how fast can this computer sort one terabyte of data First, remember that it, it has 2 GB of RAM. So you can only process 2 GB RAM it, in one, 2 GB data in one, one go. All right. So strategy would be to break down one terabyte data into the chunks of 2 GB size, which means 500 chunks, and then sort each of this chunk individually and then merge them together to get the ordered data sorting means ordering the data all right 
So give me an answer. Anybody? Are you able to hear me? So my question to you is how long, how, how much time will it take to sort such a data? That is my question to you. Anyone? A week okay see even if your answer is five times wrong it's still a good answer in this case long time okay so we in this point is that if the data is already indexed it will take a it's easy so basically indexing means sorting whenever you say indexing that's actually means sorting you remember the index at the back of the book book it's actually a sorting of the same information okay so Mohit is saying that five hours okay that is interesting anybody else All right, so just wanted to see that. How is your guesswork? So actually it takes around five hours. So Mohit is very close. All right. And so generally we feel that even if it's terabytes of data, ordering the data will be as fast as, you know, minutes, seconds, or sometimes we are too pessimistic. We think that we will not be able to sort, sort this data. Right. So my strategy was to divide this one terabyte data into 500 small pieces and then sort all of those pieces separately. Sort means ordering. Order all of the, each individual pieces separately and then merge all of this data together again. And. Right. So. So here. Joyadeep says, says that it will be around n log n, right? That is an order. And also, most of the time actually goes in, most of the time actually goes in reading the data from the disk. Okay. Reading the data from the disk is what it takes maximum time. All right. Now, <clears throat> it took me five hours and what we actually need when we deal about big data is that we might need to sort bigger data. We might need a faster need of the faster sorting because five hours may not be sufficient and we might also need to do it more often. And sorting is such a problem that almost every problem can be broken down into sorting. Starting from a, a simple select query where we say select blah 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 from my table where this column equals this value all right this one actually utilizes the sorting which is in the form of indexes right now when you join two tables when you join two tables is basically index lookup and hence we are utilizing sorting similarly when we are saying group by group by is basically a sorting so almost everything which is done at SQL level is actually sorting. So most of the problems can be fairly simply solved by breaking them down into sorting problems. All right. And therefore, therefore, everybody in the big data domain, all of these big, large companies who claim themselves to be big data product inventors, they keep on competing on sorting benchmark. 
okay and google has google and hadoop has been the winner of sorting benchmark in general okay so google claimed on 8 september 2011 that they were able to sort 10 petabyte data and it took them 6.5 hours on 8000 computers okay they utilized 8000 computers and were able to sort 10 petabyte data okay and petabyte has 15 zeros so you can you can feel that it's a it's a difficult game to win in, in when when you talk about big data the sorting is such a important issue and therefore the whole hadoop map reduce is all about sorting the data now let's move on to a little bit into architecture all right so jayadeep is doing a little bit computation so yeah most of this computation i also tried to do on the paper but i realized that i realized that it it i mean uh, the my computation were wrong that's why i ended up with 5 hours arbitrarily okay it's based on the after running it for on 1 terabyte data i reached to this number all right now let's uh, talk about the core component of the hadoop now let's talk about the upper part of this diagram we talked about the below part of diagram and the upper, upper part is what we is called yarn or map reduce engine so in very simple form exactly like hdfs architecture hadoop has got map reduce or or you can you can say yarn engine in this there are two kinds of node first one is job tracker there is only one job tracker in the network and there are multiple task trackers okay so job tracker is single and is the manager of all the task trackers job tracker does not do anything other than tracking the status of the job and basically it doesn't execute anything it just makes a note that what has been given to which task tracker and therefore job tracker keeps himself very free all right so whenever you want to get something done job tracker will break it down into into smaller parts and and then hand it over to task trackers okay each task tracker will finish their job and put it back into the queue and then and once all of the task trackers have finished job tracker will give the feedback back to the end user that your work is done all right and so <clears throat> so this is the general architecture of job tracker and task tracker so you submit a job to job tracker job tracker divides the work onto task trackers and let it execute on each task tracker all right also job uh, once a task tracker goes down the work is handed over to next task tracker the work is handed over to the next task tracker and the same work and, and the output of the first one which has gone down is completely ignored all right so that is how it maintains the resilience even if there are multiple computers going down it is able to give out the results without any problems and that is the power of the whole network effect all right now <clears throat> also whenever we want we, we ask job tracker that to to process some file or something we tell job tracker that this file is located on hdfs and now job tracker will do another clever thing it will send the work to only those task trackers which are located near your file as we 
talked earlier, your file will be located on few data nodes. Say your file is located on to only two, two data nodes. This data node, this data node, and this data node. All right. First, second, third. Now, job tracker will only send the the processing to task tracker one, task tracker two, and task tracker three. It will not send the work to another, any other node unless these nodes are very busy. If these nodes are busy, then the work is sent to any other nodes. Otherwise, it will always send the the computation to the nodes which are free as well as closer to the data right so data is anyway stored on data nodes task tracker is also a process which is run on the same data node and uh, on the on the data nodes generally and job tracker is run on the same nodes as admin node but not necessary these are just the processes running on various ports on various machines you can keep on moving them from one, one place to another all right and i missed to answer somebody's question earlier can the same computer be both name node and data node the answer is yes so if you download the virtual machine which will be providing in those cases the, your single single virtual machine will be having all the things data node task tracker job tracker admin node name node everything it will be on the single computer so you are free to install all the services on any computer but you need to be little cautious because if you, you need to make sure that the the load is distributed across the network all right does it make sense if the job is not scheduled on the same node that has data wouldn't there be a replication overhead yes there will be a replication overhead but so chandrasekhar's point is what if what if these nodes on which the data is lying are all of them busy okay now you will have to send it to some node which does not have that data and therefore there will be a overhead of copying the data from the node to the local machine and then processing it so yes that is true but that is rare because your data is replicated right your data is replicated um, having some replication factor two or three so therefore same block is existing on three places so there are three candidates for becoming task tracker and hence you will always find you there are high chances that you will find at least one node free out of the three nodes containing that block does it make sense on the chicken good all right so let's move on so it it looks like in the diagram it looks like this there is a job tracker then there are task trackers task trackers are doing ta actual job while job tracker is just doing a bookkeeping meaning which task tracker is doing what is task tracker down or is task tracker up is it responding to the heartbeats is it sending the heartbeats or not so that is the job of task tracker and whenever you submit a job you always submit to job trackers all right so is this architecture clear all right so the way it happens is the another step by step process that user submits the job to hadoop map reduce client map reduce client creates various splits and gives it to the job tracker and submits the job and then upload the job information uh on to the file system all right so this is basically what i have just now told that the, this is how 
the job tracker behaves job tracker is maintaining a job queue job tracker is maintaining a job queue and handing over the task to each each individual task trackers and they are working independently and they are pushing back uh, their work into the job queue that i'm done i'm done i'm not done i'm still working that kind of information is kept in job queue in case any of this task tracker is down its place is taken by any other and this is ensured by job tracker by sending continuous heartbeats to each tracker when a tracker fails to respond to the heartbeat of the job tracker job tracker assumes that task tracker is down and therefore hand over the work to another task tracker and this this sort of thing this architect this kind of architecture is anyway followed in any i mean it's a it's a quite a common sense way of doing things all right so basically <clears throat> the work is divided across the network onto all the machines right so this this job of job tracker task tracker and handing over the job and and allocating resources is the role of yarn yet another resource allocator okay resource negotiator that is the component of hadoop which takes care of all of this right now so is this clear should i move on so is this uh, this architecture clear to you there is a job tracker task tracker and job tracker is maintaining a queue assigning the task to each individual getting the heartbeats in case any of these down the work goes to somebody else great so varun is saying that it's okay. he's okay with what i've explained but others are not okay right can data produced by one task task be consumed by another that's a very good question chandrasekhar the answer is immediate answer is uh, no if they are part of the same batch process they can't do that each individual task tracker will work on its own piece of data and they, these task tracker do not communicate with each other do not consume each other's data they run parallelly on things right if you have to if you have to get your data consumed by another one you'll have to create another process which will run after this finishes so anulita's question is what is the timing of heartbeat uh, all right so timing i think is um, around few, few uh, uh, i mean around a second or so okay but exact number i think that keeps changing within how many seconds they pass the heartbeats per second so i mean it's around a second but i don't know exact number all right but i can check uh, on the cluster which we are running that what is their heartbeat time all right so when will the task complete after the da data replication is complete so task will complete here task will complete when the job queue job queue is responded by all the task trackers right or if it is taking too much time it will kill that task tracker who is taking too much time and say job failed so the job queue when the, when all of the task trackers respond that i'm done i'm done i'm done and and, and th therefore it will say that the work is complete all right does it make sense and secure
all right now the other question is somebody just now asked now as somebody just now asked the the can the data produced by one task be consumed by another there are many such questions that come in right and so building your logic such that even if it is distributed on multiple computers and and is itself a very difficult thing there are concurrency issues how would i communicate between dust records what if my data is uh, i mean what if my data is sequentially processed so there are many such many such problems and so to to basically make something very very distributable they came up with something called map reduce paradigm map reduce is a paradigm where you define that this is what i want to this is the, the file i want to churn right and on top of that file you say that this is my map and this is my reduce and map is something that translate your file from one form to another and reduce is something which gathers the data from all the mappers and and, and then summarizes it all right so map map reduce is a great paradigm and we would spend three sessions on map reduce to understand every bit of it Con able, we will be able to convert we will practice converting every kind of problems into map reduce there are some problems which cannot be converted but we will try our best to convert most of the problem including a problem such as matrix multiplication all right how can that happen over hundreds of computers how can matrix multiplication happen over hundreds of computer that kind of problems is solved using map reduce so i'll just try i'll just give it a very quick time to explain to you what happens in case of map reduce so you write two functions one is called map other is called reduce in these functions in the function called map you take an input and convert it into key value pairs okay you convert it into key value pairs any input now hadoop will order that order that key keys and group all the values together and hand it over to your reduce function reduce function will basically take all the values bunched together for a key and summarize it in whatever format you want it whether you want to compute average you want to com compute sum of all the values for a key and that kind of thing right so that is the mechanism called map reduce so you write two functions one is map other is reduce map takes an input file and converts it into key value pairs and those key value pairs are taken by map reduce engine which converts those values by key and and groups the values together and hand over those values to reduce function all right so that is the paradigm called map reduce map reduce is basically a sort of a group by clause in like the way we in group by we say that group my data by this column similarly in map we say that my the key for my data is this group my data based on this and what is the what is the reduce or what is the aggregation function to be applied in a group by clause is what is defined by your reduce function reduce function can have any logic you wish to have okay and using using this map reduce paradigm lots of complex problems have been solved map reduce is the first was the first paradigm which was basically used by google for creating their page rank page rank is how many pages are voting for you and what is the value of the each page who is voting for you your page and based on this kind of a voting it builds the page rank so that kind of a complex system is basically built on top of uh, map reduce all right so even if you don't understand map reduce right now do not worry do not worry it takes some times to be able to co convert 
any problem into MapReduce. Map gives key values and Hadoop uh, groups the keys together, groups all the values of a key together and give, give the list of the values for a key to the reduce function and reduce function returns the aggregation of those values. All right. So Chansekhar's question I missed to answer. When will the task complete after data replication is complete? No, actually only one copy of the data, data is sufficient to return. All right. Even if the replication is delayed, it's okay to get complete. All right. And anyway, the job keeps on running all the time. And uh, I mean, in the background, you submit the job, it keeps running and you can keep on querying whether the data has been copied or not. Okay. Great. So this was a very, very brief thumbnail sketch of what is MapReduce? Even if you did not get it right now, it is because I have not explained it well. It might take a more time, little bit more examples, hands-on exercises to understand MapReduce. So do not panic or worry right now. All right. This is supposed to be a very simple and generic. Now these are the other components of Hadoop ecosystem. All right. We have got Hadoop distributed file system. Hadoop distributed file system is what is the base for all the all the components. Everybody depends on HDFS. On top of HDFS, we had got yarn. Yarn is what? The mechanism of delegating the work to the network, to the multitude of computers. That is yarn. And one form of this delegation is MapReduce paradigm. We create maps and reduces hands over to yarn then another form is spark in which we write a script in, in in the form of spark script itself it has got a little different but on similar lines as map reduce of a paradigm of distributing the work all right and so on there is a graph giraffe which is running on yarn which is a graph graph processing framework and then there is something called HBase. HBase is basically a NoSQL database. What is NoSQL database? These databases which are are not able to provide you SQL kind of um, acid properties in order to give you the scale. Okay. So HBase database is for storing billions of rows and hundreds of millions of hundreds of millions of columns billions of rows and millions of columns okay for that kind of need you use hbase all right for that kind of need where you need to store so much of data so much of, you have got so much of data you use hbase hbase is basically a structured form of files all right so so you understand the difference between a file, HDFS and HBase? HDFS is basically for storing files, and HBase is for if you are if your data is little tabular, tabular, and it's humongous. In those cases, you use HBase. All right. Now, these are the basic components, and after that, we have got Hive. Hive basically is an SQL query mechanism or sql query platform which which converts whatever sql query you write into mapreduce logic and runs it runs it on top of hbase and mapreduce and yarn all right and hdfs so hive is such a thing which makes you in, instead of you keep on writing these mapreduce jobs or spark scripts you can express your logic in sql Okay, Hive query language is very close to SQL. So Hive is very, very important, though it's quite simple to use. And uh, therefore, it's, 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 we have included Hive into the project also. 
right we'll devote one whole three hour uh two hours from, uh, likely on to hive then there is something called pig latin after a while people realize that hive is not working out first reason is that standard sql was not meant for big data and therefore standard sql could not do justice because standard sql did not focus on various kinds of constructs for optimization and in case of big data churning you require optimization at every every step all right so that is hive so to to bring in the optimization into place people started with big latin big latin is a newer language far far simpler than sql and all the candidates who knew sql earlier after attending the sessions they all ended up using pig as their pig latin as their first language okay so that is the beauty of pig latin it's fairly simple right so raghavendra question is that is it necessary to know each of the components to become hadoop developer no you don't need to learn all of these components it is up to you to know each of these components but my strong recommendation to you is know the basics of all of these components so that you can be very efficient some tasks are great done in pig latin some tasks are greatly done in hive and some tasks are meant to be written in MapReduce. okay when you churn the data some tasks might be more uh, far better when it comes to spark okay and therefore therefore i i recommend that you know this ecosystem better so that you can quickly hand pick and stitch the whole solution right and to stitch this solution you would require a component like uzi to which you will say that finish my hive first whatever data is coming out of hive query give it to pig latin queries and after the pig latin query is finished they pass it to mahat mahat is basically a machine learning library it's a it's a library of algorithms for machine learning machine learning such as clustering data figuring out similar data figuring out recommendation those kind of things are done with mahat mahat is basically a collection of algorithms specifically machine learning algorithms and they are very important so so basically you write your code some in uzi some in hive some in pig latin and then mahat and then and all of this you can utilize very seamlessly using uzi okay so that is that, that's most likely and before that before you start churning the data you need to import the data right uh, for importing the data you what you do is if you have unstructured data such as apache logs and other files you could use a tool called flume flume basically distributedly imports the data onto the cluster all right now similarly you have got scoop if you've got mysql databases oracle databases and you want to move that data onto file system or hbase then scoop is more than enough for you all right So Hive is tied with HBase. That's Chan Sekar's question. Uh, my answer is no. Hive basically helps you churning HBase as well as plain text file, CSV files, and everything. Okay, you can mark in Hive that this is my plain text HTML file, and churn it that way, and it will internally convert every query you write into MapReduce tasks and execute them. All right, great, great. Any other questions at this point? So, 
So these are the various components. So you can interact with all of these components via Uzi or via command line, via Java libraries or via Python. Any of these in any of these languages, right? Now this is the whole ecosystem which is generally referred as umbrella for Hadoop. Although there are few more tools and there will be more tools which will Hive is I think not I mean it has it is still incubated. So th this is the ecosystem of the whole Hive. Which are the most commonly used components? That is Raghavendra's point. So all of these are actually used simultaneously. Okay, it is not. Uh, it, uh, I mean, only alternative points here are Hive and Pig Latin and MapReduce. Okay, so here we generally use either of these three in order to solve our problem. So basically, what I have found is people either use Hive or Pig Latin, but people have sometimes end up using MapReduce as a result of uh, the kind of problems you face. Okay, if your problem is quite complex and it's difficult to solve that in Big Latin, MapReduce might come very handy. All right. And all of these are fairly fairly well used. Whenever you have to import the data, it will be okay. Now, Sujit's question is: There a job profile something as Hadoop infrastructure management? These are, if you mean to say with respect to career, there are many 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 jobs, and they are very very greatly paid. Okay, so Mahesh's question is, in this ecosystem, where is Java program used? Java program is used in MapReduce first. You can write your MapReduce logic in Java. Second, whenever you are stitching these together or you are accessing directly the Pig Latin, you can use their API, which is in Java, to access any of this. Similarly, similarly, we can, we have Mahat, whose al algorithms can be accessed using using Java library. Make sense? So Sujit's question is: Does MapReduce be done using scripting languages? It can be done, MapReduce can be done using a scripted language also, but primary support is of Java. All right. There are streaming jobs which help you run any code, any binary, any script on Hadoop MapReduce. Okay. CLI is command line interface. All right. Any other questions at this point? So Scala is specifically used in case of Spark. All right. Not elsewhere. All right. So, Scala is used in case of only Spark, not elsewhere. And any other questions on this? So, we discussed almost all aspects of Hadoop ecosystem, and those who are part of our paid classes, they can go to the Cloud Labs here and start accessing the i'll just give a quick look and 
All right, so hue is one where you can interact with most of these components. So hue is an interface which provides you access to all of these components like pig Latin, you can write query in there. Using Hive, you can write query, upload your map, Mahar task, you can do your Uzi work. Everything can be done over here. So you can do a job browser like this is your HDFS. So if you see, it's like a proper file system. All right. Beneath the beneath the skin, all of these files are distributed across our cluster. It's not on a single system. And say this file will be divided. If it is bigger file, then it is divided into small small pieces and put onto the network. All right. Like this file is 31 MB. Actually, there was a few GB file, like 20 GB file. That's, I don't know where. I think that's in another user's account. So this is what you get access to and you upload your data over here and start working on it. All right. So this is, this is the Ambari. This is admin interface, which is showing that what is going on where. We have four data nodes running right now. And this is the disk space. This is the heap memory being consumed by names, name node, and so on. Okay, so so Hue, which is running on 8080 port, is basically an interface, a gateway to the admin jobs, right? You can monitor the whole system here. All of these components are there on 8000 port. Okay, on 8000 port is a uh, our hue running hue is an interface where you can interact with each service the way we can create folder upload files onto hdfs similarly we can see the status of our job which are running on on, on um, hadoop and we have got uzi in uzi we can create our script and run it here we can upload the scripts and run it and similarly we, you can interact with uh, pig latin here you can write your piglet in script and execute them like the way other people have written. These are this is the example of a piglet in script. It's a very simple one where we said load this, filter this data, and describe this. It's as simple as that. Similarly, we have got Hive UI where we can write SQL query and churn any data. All right. So here we can write our select query. So these are very nice interface and for each of these components, Hive, Pig, every component, you have got a nice command line interface also. All right. So go through this, those who have taken the class already, who has attended, uh, I mean, a part of the all sessions, go through, go through our, first you go to through your courses under my courses. Okay, there you will get the whole installation document and everything. Also, all the recordings will be available here. And under Hue, you will see you will see all the services required. You browse through them. And similarly, have a look at the admin console. They'll give you a good idea. Set up your own virtual machine if you want to. This is not required. If you have access to the cluster, then this is not required. But for just for curiosity sake, you might love to install it. So the easiest way to install a whole Hadoop ecosystem on your desktop is downloading virtual machine and then load it. That's all. So that instructions are given here. And we are uh, mostly going with Hortonworks packaging instead of Cloudera right now. Okay. And also finish the quiz available in the learning management system. So that's pretty much with respect to classes and the next next full class is starting from 8th November, which means the first session, which was today will be repeated on 8th November on 9th November will be the second class. All right. And this is 33 hours, which is three hours into 11 classes and every Saturday, Sunday for three hours from 8.30 PM to 11.30 PM. All right. So this is about our whole courses and
if you, do you have any questions for me or was i successful in putting you to sleep mm, i was successful in putting you to sleep all right so is there any certification attached with this so we give our certification based on how you perform in the course all right so just like hot and works cloudera mapar they give the certification we also provide our certification based on your performance what are the components covered in this course so almost every component which we discussed in this diagram plus few more okay all of this flume hdfs scoop hbase mapreduce hive piglatin mahat spark yarn uzi and then how to interact using java plus few more such as uh, such as such as zookeeper so zookeeper is one extra component which will be which will study plus one extra session would be for deciding on which technology to use when in what circumstances what technology stack you should be using right because that is that is the fairly important question to all of us so is any time any real time project be included in the course yes the in, uh, almost all the uh, projects which we will be doing will be based on the real time okay any any good books so good books will be based on each sessions because there are multiple components so we have drilled down onto different 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 books and also summarized in our own language using our own content all right so we will be giving uh, details about the books just like we have given here that the further reading is this one and similarly uh, at the every session we will be giving out the name of the books you should go for further reference so uh, uh, anulita's point is that uh, she mean to say that if the, she will get a chance to work on any project so for the real time project so the way we have done is we have created uh, two kinds of project level a and level b level a is a very simple project very simple project and very predefined output project okay so level a is uh, mandatory for all who take this session while level b is a little longer one 3 weeks one which we which is basically a real life project okay from industry so level b is little difficult to people if you are performing really good in level a then we give the level b one okay and there is no extra cost associated with the, any project all right so if you we performed really good with respect to finishing the exercise plus in the level a project then we consider you for the level b all right so Th that was uh, i was trying to answer anulita's question all right so that's pretty much from my side and can freshers pursue this course so f i mean it's a uh, you know difficult question to answer but there is a huge huge market and huge variety of uh, you know career choices right so for freshers there there might be opportunities in this domain as well just like in any any other domain so freshers can definitely pursue this course as long as they have a basic idea about databases about basics of programming job is definitely there for everybody in the industry but but
the high paying jobs are generally for the little senior people in this industry because uh, because people are expecting you to know a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, you know understanding of the basic components okay but definitely there is a scope for everybody in this domain all right so this is about the course and feel free to get in touch if you have any questions all right so thank you very much and again this is my my email id and number you can get in touch with us anytime thank you guys and have a good night do you provide any job assistance so yes and no we do not give any guarantee for the job but we do connect you to the various recruiters who are working with us okay so we connect uh, you to them and and basically they take you on priority all right because there has been a good experience for them thank you sujit thank you chandrasekhar thank you varun thank you raghavendr good night jadeep good night varun thank you anulita thank you mahesh good night anulita and feel free to ask me a question if you have any doubt thank you gaurav thank you raghavendra all right All right good night guys have a good day All right good night then now I'm disconnecting thank you for attending the session